Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Professor Shahram Mahbarzadeh. I am the convener of uh, Middle East uh, Studies Forum at Deakin University, and um, it is my pleasure to be welcoming you all uh, to our um, very important discussion on the Israeli treatment of its Palestinian population. Uh, especially, we are looking at a human rights report that was released um, probably over a month ago now. So Human Rights uh, Watch report entitled a Th Threshold Crossed, Israeli Authorities and the Crimes of Apartheid and Persecution, examines Israel's treatment of Palestinians and um, evaluates if Israeli policies and practices uh, in these areas amount to crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution. The report draws on years of human rights documentation, case studies, and a review of government planning documents and statements by officials. And based on these uh, extensive investigations, the report concludes that uh, Israel's, uh, Israelis um, officials have committed the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution. Human Rights Watch calls on Israel to end apartheid and persecution. It also spells out actions that the international community could take in order to achieve this um, end. We are very fortunate to have the lead author of uh, the Human Rights Report uh, with us, uh, Omar Shakir um, is an Israel-Palestine director at Human Rights Watch, where he investigates uh, human rights abuses in Israel and the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, prior to his current role, he was the Bertha Fellow at the Center for Constitutional Rights, where he focused on U.S. counterterrorism policies, including legal representation of Guantanamo Bay detainees. Um, as the um, author R and Rebecca D. Feinberg Fellow at the Human Rights Watch, he investigated human rights violations in Egypt, including the Rabaul massacre, one of the largest killing of protesters in a single day. Uh, he's a former Fulbright Fellow, uh, Fulbright Scholar in, um, in Syria, and he holds a JD from Stanford Law School, where he authored a report on the civilian consequence of US drone strikes in Pakistan as a part of International Human Rights and Conflict Resolution Clinic. Um, so as you, can as you can see and you can tell, he is well qualified to talk to us today about uh, Human Rights Watch report and the current situation in Israel and Palestine. So Omar, floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Shahram uh, Mahmoud and the Middle East Studies Forum uh, for hosting this event and to all of you for joining uh, into the evening, uh, spending your evening with us. I really look forward um, to the discussion. What I'll try and do in my time to leave, you know, I think a good amount of time for question and answers is really just try to lay out our findings um, in this report, how we arrived at them, the law in which it was based on, the recommendations, and the way forward um, as we see it at Human Rights Watch and look forward to your questions, discussions, and comments. Let me start by saying that Human Rights Watch has been documenting human rights abuses in Israel and Palestine for well over three decades. Abuses by Israeli authorities, Palestinian authorities, Palestinian armed groups, among many other actors. In recent years, we've noticed that discrimination has become more and more a theme of our work, and that reflects the reality on the ground. You can look back at our body of work and find major, I'm talking you know, 80, 100 plus page reports from 2001 about the treatment and discrimination in schools inside Israel between Jewish Israelis and Palestinians who attend separate schools. Or in 2008, um, the Israeli government's policy of failing to recognize dozens of Palestinian Bedouin villages in the Negev. Or in 2010, a report called Separate and Unequal about the situation in East Jerusalem 
and in Area C, the majority of the West Bank under Israel's exclusive rule. Um, or you can look at 2016, Occupation Inc., that looked at the entirety of the West Bank. I could go on and on, but the idea here is these reports, while I think they captured important dynamics in certain areas, failed, I think, to speak to the underlying reality on the ground, which is what motivated us to undertake the study that Shaharam mentioned in his outset. What I mean by the underlying reality is a situation in which a single government rules over an area. So here I'm talking about the Israeli government, which primarily rules over the area between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, in which two groups of roughly equal size live, Jewish Israelis and Palestinians and where the government's policy has methodically privileged one group, Jewish Israelis, and systematically repressed the other group, Palestinians, to varying degrees of intensity. So while Jewish Israelis are governed under the same law and have the same rights and privileges wherever they live, Palestinians are discriminated against wherever they live. And so many of the assumptions that the international conversation on Israel-Palestine is built on seem disconnected from this reality. The idea that a 50 plus year occupation is temporary, that Palestinians are in charge of their own affairs when Israel has exclusive control over 90% of the territory between the river and the sea, and in the remaining 10% controls the movement of people and goods, the airspace, the water space, the borders, the population registry, natural resources, and on and on. The idea that Israel is a democracy when it rules over nearly 5 uh, million Palestinians who have no say over the government that rules over them. Or the idea that a 30 year peace process will soon end all of these abuses. What this report tries to do in 213 pages is to assess Israel's treatment of Palestinians living under its rule. It connects the dots between years of Human Rights Watch research, in addition to the several years of work we did on case studies and other research for this report. We then took the facts that we documented and weighed it against the established international law on discrimination. There is a universal prohibition under international law on severe discrimination uh, or oppression, known as apartheid. So while the term was coined in relation to South Africa, international treaties define it as a universal legal term, including of course, the International Convention on Race, the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. International law also defines apartheid as a crime against humanity, both under a 1970s convention as well as under the 1998 Rome Statute to the International Criminal Court. As a crime against humanity, apartheid primarily refers to three things. Like many crimes, there is an act, there is an intent or mental state, and there's a context. With apartheid, the act is known as inhumane acts, which, which refers to a set of defined grave abuses grave abuses like um, forcible transfer, like mass land expropriation, like the denial of the right to leave and enter one's country. Then you have the intent. The intent for apartheid that's required is an intent by one group of people to dominate another. And the context is systematic oppression by the dominant group over the marginalized group. So intent to dominate, systematic oppression, inhumane acts. Again, the exact wording of the definition you can find on you know, in the Rome Statute, but it basically boils down to those three elements. Let me just say a couple of notes about the law on apartheid, which is important context for our conversation. First is the convention and the Rome Statute use the term racial group. But international human rights law has long defined racial discrimination and racial group more generally to refer to distinctions based on ethnicity, national origin, descent, et cetera. And international criminal law has said when applying the law to the facts, you need to look at the local context, at construction by local actors, which of course maps social sciences 
evolving notions of race. It's also worth noting that the law focuses on domination, not on sovereignty. So you look at who, in, in, in effect, rules over an area, not what the formal legal distinctions are, for which there is a meaningful distinction between Israel and the Green Line and the occupied territory. And finally, apartheid can be assessed looking at any geographic area. You can look at it in a sub-region, in a whole state, in a whole area under a, a state's rule. Finally, let me talk about a related crime against humanity, which is persecution. Under international law, it refers to discriminatory intent when it leads to severe abuses of fundamental rights, defined also under the Rome Statute and under customary international law. It's the exact same severity gravity as apartheid. It's one of the 11 crimes against humanity under the Rome Statute. When Human Rights Watch applied the facts that I mentioned to the law that's well established, we reached the conclusion that Israeli authorities are committing the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution. We base this finding on two primary things. One is a policy or an intent we documented by the Israeli government to maintain the domination by Jewish Israelis over Palestinians across Israel and the occupied territory. And secondly, the particularly grave abuses carried out in the occupied territory. Let me walk through the elements of the crimes that I laid out and how we applied the facts to the law to provide you a better context about our report. Starting with the intent or mental state requirement, our research shows that Israeli policy has sought to maximize control over demographics and land for the benefit of Jewish Israelis and to the detriment of Palestinians. When it comes to demographics, the Israeli government has openly undertaken policies to combat the demographic threat that it claims Palestinians pose. And I use demographic threat between quotes. For example, a 2003 Knesset law renewed every year since forbids in effect the granting of permanent legal status to Palestinians in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip married to Israeli citizens and nationals, a restriction that does not exist for the foreign spouses of Israelis from virtually any other country. As a side note, this law is in the news today. I mean, just minutes before I came on this presentation because the law is up for renewal and the Likud party in a cynical move to undermine the new Israeli government has basically said, this law is essential for demographics. This government can't pass it. And has said it, the opposition will not support the law's passage. I'm confident it will be passed and renewed again, but it again speaks to the consensus on demographic objectives. On land policies, the Israeli government has sought to maximize the land available for Jewish Israelis and confine Palestinians into dense enclaves across Israel and the occupied territory. This policy takes different forms. For example, in the uh, inside Israel, the Israeli government has a formal policy to Judaize the Negev and the Galilee, regions that account for two thirds um, the land inside Israel and much of the Palestinian population. In these areas, the Israeli government has authorized by law small admissions committees in hundreds of small Jewish Israeli towns to exclude Palestinians from living there. And a study done by Professor at Haifa University has found that there are hundreds of small Jewish towns and communities spread across the country that have no Palestinians living in them. Inside Jerusalem, which includes both occupied East Jerusalem and West Jerusalem, the formal planning document for the, uh, for, for the Israeli government sets out the goal of, quote, maintaining a solid Jewish majority in the city and even sets target demographic ratios that it hopes to maintain between Jewish Israelis and Palestinians. The same document actually talks about pursuing this aim through densification and thickening of Palestinian neighborhoods. In the West Bank, this dynamic plays out most dramatically where government plans that have guided the settlement policy such as the 1980 Drobel's plans, sets out in clear words, quote, 
calling for it. I mean, it calls for authorities to, quote, settle the land between the Arab minority population centers and their surroundings, end quote, noting that doing so would, quote, make it harder for Palestinians to create territorial contigu contiguity and political unity and remove any trace of doubt about our intent to control Judea and Samaria forever. These are not merely words on paper. The massive expansion of settlements in recent years and the roads and other infrastructures to connect settlements to Israel proper make clear the intent to dominate in perpetuity. Even inside the Gaza Strip, where the Israeli government withdrew its settler population and ground troops in 2005, the Israeli government has made clear the demographic uh, uh, logic that drives this policy. It was announced by officials at the time. And our study of the 16 year policy since shows that its enforcement has aimed at taking off the large Palestinian population of Gaza, 2 million people effectively off the demographic books. For example, by preventing Gaza residents from moving to the West Bank, even though under even the Israeli government's recognition in international law, it's a single territorial unit with the West Bank. This points to an objective of, in effect, gerrymandering, um, you know, or creating a Jewish majority across the West Bank and Israel while turning Gaza into effectively an open air prison for Palestinians living there who they control via other means. These policies amount to an intent to dominate, one of the elements of apartheid and a discriminatory intent, one of the elements of persecution. Let me say a word here about security before I move on. Many of the abuses at the heart of apartheid and persecution, such as land grabs, the denial of building permits on a discriminatory basis, the restriction on legal residency have no security justification or use security as mere pretext to advance demographic objectives. And even where security forms part of the motivation, the Israeli government has not only gone beyond what international law authorizes, but it actually has pursued the strategy through domination which no more negates apartheid or persecution than a partial security logic would negate the crimes of torture, you know, or excessive force, or even indiscriminate force. The second part of the analysis in the report looks at the two-tiered system established by the Israeli government. And we find that the means used in the occupied Palestinian territory amount to systematic oppression the second part of the apartheid analysis. Let me talk about some of these means in brief. They include the imposition of draconian military rule over 2.7 million Palestinians in the occupied West Bank while Jewish Israeli settlers living in settlements that are illegal under international law, more than 400,000 in the West Bank excluding East Jerusalem alone are governed under Israeli civil law. So what this means in practice is that a Palestinian and a Jewish Israeli living in the same territory, maybe even living across the street, who commit the very same crime, are treated by the same government in different courts, where they can face different penalties for the same crime and where they have substantially different due process rights. In addition, the Israeli government enforces segregation in the West Bank. Palestinians can only enter settlements as laborers bearing special permits. In addition, the Israeli government has not only plundered the land and resources from Palestinians in the West Bank, but if the land redistributed for civilian use, according to government data, more than 99% went to settlements. Systematic oppression takes a different form in East Jerusalem, but many of the same dynamics are in play. Take, for example, the recent events in Sheikh Jarrah. The underlying law that's being used by the Israeli government to justify the takeover of longtime Palestinian homes by Jewish Israeli settlers is a 1970 law that allows Jewish Israelis to claim property they say they owned in East Jerusalem before 1948. However, the Palestinians said to be displaced 
are themselves refugees who are denied under Israeli law the right to reclaim property they owned, not only inside Israel, but even inside Jerusalem itself. So the same Israeli law for the same issue, reclaiming property before 1948, has a different policy for Jewish Israelis and Palestinians, even though for Jewish Israelis, we're talking about land in occupied territory, whereas for Palestinians, this is land they lived in for generations. In, in the Gaza Strip, the means of systematic oppression take a different form, and it's not only the armed hostilities, the wars that we've seen uh, over recent years, but it's the fact that for 14 years, the Israeli government has imposed a generalized ban on the movement of Palestinians inside and outside of the territory. Let me be crystal clear. The policy is nobody in, nobody out, unless you fall within a set of narrow humanitarian exemptions. This is not a security policy. The same person that may one week be allowed to travel because they're getting an, a life-saving procedure, may the next week be denied a permit to go on vacation or to attend a university abroad. The policy also applies to goods. There are sweeping restrictions on the entry and exit of goods, which has played a critical role in crippling the economy of, of Gaza. 80% of the population rely on humanitarian aid. GDP per capita has dropped since the early 1990s. The majority of families spend the majority of their day without electricity. 97% of the water is undrinkable. These means used amount to systematic oppression, the second rung of apartheid. The report though also talks about the serious um, you know, abuses and discrimination that take place inside Israel proper. Most starkly in the Negev, where you have 35 Palestinian Bedouin villages that are not recognized by the Israeli government or that more than 90,000 residents live unconnected to electricity and water grids, effectively illegally in their own homes facing the constant prospect of demolitions and where thousands of demolitions have been carried out over the years, including Al-Araqib, one village that has itself been demolished more than 185 times, the same village. The third part of our analysis looks at the abuses carried out against Palestinians pursuant to this intent and amid a context of systematic oppression. Our report documents five clusters of inhumane acts and severe abuses of fundamental rights, the third element of apartheid and second of persecution uh, in the occupied Palestinian territory. These means include one, the sweeping restrictions on movement, not only the aforementioned closure of Gaza, but the permit regime in the West Bank, the fact that Palestinians must obtain permits, which are very difficult to get to enter large sections of the West Bank. And even if they get permits, they must cross through the nearly 600 checkpoints and other closure obstacles spread across the West Bank, which can turn a short commute into a humiliating hours long ordeal. While Jewish Israelis are permitted largely unfettered movement throughout the occupied West Bank. There's also the separation barrier, which is built largely on Palestinian land and separates thousands of farmers from their agricultural land and families from their communities, schools, and hospitals. The second cluster of inhumane acts we document are the, are, are the mass expropriation of Palestinian land. More than one third of the West Bank in East Jerusalem has been confiscated from Palestinians, taken by the Israeli government via different mechanisms that the report lays out. These land grabs have reduced Palestinians to living in 165 disconnected territorial islands. The third cluster of inhumane acts we document are the coercive conditions in area C of the West Bank, as well as in East Jerusalem that make it effectively impossible for Palestinians to obtain a building permit. Between 2016 and 2018, according to Israeli government data, the Israeli government issued 100 times more demolition orders than building permits for Palestinians in Area C of the West Bank. There have been thousands of homes, schools, and businesses demolished 
simply for lacking a building permit, which goes against what international law allows occupiers to do. As I speak to you today, there are 46 Palestinian communities, according to the UN, at risk of full demolition. The fourth cluster of inhumane acts we document are the sweeping denials of residency rights. More than half a million Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza denied their right to live there because they were abroad for too long, because they weren't there in 1967 when the occupation began, or as a result of the effective freeze on the population registry that Israel manages since 2000. And fifth and finally, the report talks about the sweeping denial of civil rights, suspension of the rights to free expression, assembly and association for the 4.7 million Palestinians in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. These findings are the most stark that Human Rights Watch has ever reached on the conduct of Israeli authorities. It's the first time we found that Israeli authorities have committed crimes against humanity. Our recommendations are in line with, with where we found crimes against humanity in other contexts, including, for example, finding the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution against the treatment of the Rohingya Muslims in Burma and in Myanmar. Our recommendations to the Israeli government are obvious and apartheid and persecution and all forms of privilege and repression that, that, that benefit Jewish Israelis to the detriment of Palestinians, including with regards to free movement, um, allocation of land and resources, access to water, electricity and other services, and the granting of building permits. For the Israeli government, we have six clusters of main asks that I'll go through very much in brief. One is for recognition of the crimes taking place today and statements to that effect. Secondly, we call for, which has already happened, for the UN to establish a commission of inquiry to look into severe discrimination based on group identity across Israel and Palestine. That was put in place last month following the issuance of our report. The second part of that rec has not come into fruition yet, which is for the UN to establish a global envoy for the crimes of apartheid and persecution with the mandate to look into all situations of apartheid and persecution across the globe. Third, we call for the International Criminal Court to investigate and prosecute those Israeli officials implicated in the crimes of apartheid and persecution, as well as for national courts to do so under the principle of universal jurisdiction. I'll note here, since I'm speaking to you know, a university based in Australia, how shameful the Australia position has been on the International Criminal Court. Um, maybe the most shameful um, of all non-countries named Israel in the US in the world, not supporting the investigation into serious crimes potentially committed in Israel-Palestine. Fourth, we call for targeted sanctions, including asset freezes and travel bans against those Israeli officials implicated in the crime. Fifth, we call for conditioning arms sales and all military and security assistance to the Israeli government on steps to end apartheid and persecution. And finally, we call for all states to look into all forms of bilateral engagement with Israel to ensure non-complicity in the crime, to minimize the human rights impacts of this engagement and were not possible to end those activities. Let me conclude and turn to conversation with the following points, which I think really summarize what this report is all about. A 54-year occupation is not temporary. A 30-year peace process will not, by itself, end systematic oppression. Denying millions of Palestinians of their fundamental rights solely because of who they are, solely because they were born Palestinian and not Jewish, is not simply a matter of abusive occupation. The first step to solving any problem is to diagnose it correctly. The wrong diagnosis leads to the wrong conclusion. For years, the world has treated apartheid as some future hypothetical scenario. But this is not 1974 when Yitzhak Rabin warned of the prospect of apartheid or 2006 when Jimmy Carter warned 
peace, not apartheid, or even 2014, when John Kerry warned that we were on the brink of apartheid. In 2021, the threshold has been crossed. Indeed, it may well have been crossed years or decades ago, as our Palestinian friends warned us, but too many didn't listen. Apartheid is the present day reality for millions of Palestinians. Don't just take my word for it. Take the word of two former Israeli ambassadors to South Africa, who themselves issued an op-ed last week saying that the situation amounted to apartheid. Take the words of the governments of South Africa or Namibia, which last week at a UN event that I spoke at endorsed the report's finding of apartheid in its entirety. Take the words of Israeli human rights groups like Betselem, you know, like uh, Yeshdin, like Adala, like um, Kerem Nevot that have issued poundings of apartheid in recent years. The bottom line here is that for too long, those who care about Israeli-Palestinian peace have focused so much on a solution that they've forgotten the problem that necessitates a solution. The problem here at its core has to do with the Israeli government's policies and discrimination against Palestinians. Those who care about Israeli-Palestinian peace, whether supporters of a two-state, a one-state solution, or a confederation, should recognize the reality for what it is, should have the courage to fight apartheid and bring to bear the sorts of human rights tools needed to end a situation of that gravity. With that, I'll conclude and look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Omar. That is uh, a very powerful presentation. We have about uh, 25 minutes or so for Q&A. So if you have any questions, please use the uh, raise hand function. Um, I'll ask you to introduce yourself and then you can ask a question. Please keep your questions uh, brief and succinct so that we can accommodate as many questions as we can. So um, while you're thinking about your questions, I might pose the very first question. Um, as the prerogative of the chair, <laughs> Omar, I, I wonder if you could reflect on uh, the end game for Israel. Um, clearly, you say, um, when you think about, when you mention occupation, the image that comes up is something temporary uh, that will come to an end in a, in a near future. Whereas this has been going on for, you said, 54 years. So that's it's a pretty long time for an occupation to last. Um, and then we have this whole idea of uh, a future state for Palestinians, a two-state solution. So what's the end game for Israel? What do they want to get out of this occupation? It's a great question, Shahram. I mean, I think for the Israeli government, um, you know, there, there, are, um, there is a clear intent to dominate uh, the West Bank. I think, um, you know, the, for, there has been both political parties, whether Labour, Likud, over the years, whether it is you know um, Naftali Bennett to uh, others on the political spectrum, absent a narrow band of, of 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 folks on the political spectrum, the vast majority have sought to control the West Bank in perpetuity. It's about the land. It's about sort of um, you know ensuring control over that, and it's about ensuring that one group, Jewish Israelis, are privileged. Um, you know, at the expense of the local population. You know, I think when push comes to shove, there are some in the Israeli political spectrum that believe that, you know, Israel should withdraw, you know, from the West Bank. But even for them, withdrawal is not about human rights. It's not about uh, universal values. It's about consolidating and ensuring a Jewish majority. Because the reality here is today between the river and the sea, as I said at the outset, uh, it's about rough parity between Jewish Israelis and Palestinians, if you include, you know, a holistic look at this area. And I think the prospect of uh, losing, uh, you know, the Jewish superiority or the privilege, I think, scares many in the political spectrum. So the end game is going to depend on how actors react, you know, to this situation. Um, 
you know, I think there is certainly a, uh, you know, uh, a sense among the political establishment that Israel is strong, that it can ignore the Palestinian question. Some say that's the best, biggest legacy of the Netanyahu government. Um, you know, there are others that think that action needs to be taken to uh, get ahead of a potential movement. I mean, Ehud Omer used to warn about apartheid and to say we should get ahead of international condemnation. Ehud Barak issued a similar warning. So I think the end game Shahram will depend almost entirely on the international community's response. You know, there's a scenario where Palestinians um, continue to follow the path of, you know, Native Americans in the United States, where they're continual, continually confined to more narrow and narrow, narrower areas. Um, or there's an end game where, where there is real international action brought and where Israel's hand is forced, either leading to, you know, uh, a Palestinian state or to a situation where apartheid ends and equality, you know, reigns for all people. We at Human Rights Watch don't take a position on a political solution. Certainly both, any solution could be, I mean, not any solution, let's say, but a two state, a one state or a confederation could be consistent with human rights values. But the current reality, you know, if apartheid for millions of Palestinians is inconsistent with human rights and is in fact a crime against humanity. Okay, thanks Omar. I see that uh, Steve has raised his hand. Um, but you're not using the function. <laughs> and I see that Ahmed is clapping. I'm not sure if Ahmed is trying to raise his hand or just uh, well, uploading no. Omar's response. <laughs> but Steve, you go ahead and then we go to Riyadh. Okay, when I was teaching in uh, Israel, uh, I saw a, a article in the Jerusalem Post from the retiring chief archivist to say that 95% of their archives were um, still classified and then uh, a year later they were extended this is 2018-19 uh, last year the year before they were extended for 90 years so one of the reasons um, I concluded uh, teaching with colleagues on uh, the West Bank at a university there was that they really are in denial like Americans uh, about the foundational injustices, partly because they don't know about them. Uh, it, it, you know, it's astonishing to think, but as Elan Pape has pointed out, the whole of the, um, uh, the whole of the um, romanticization of their uh, foundation uh, means that that's true. So here's my question. Uh, can we get progress uh, to come to a realization by defunding, by uh, getting America to confront uh, its in denial? What's the uh, solution? I'd be interested in other panelists as well to the in denial. My own country was in denial to the 1980s. We fessed up, we instituted a compo and return for land. Uh, it was a process that's still going on. It's only um, represented 4% of the unimproved value of that land, but it's been accepted by both parties. I can't see it happening in Israel. The threshold is 3.75. You can't get any agreement from within the country. So what do you think is the way to burst the bubble to, uh, as we did with uh, South Africa, um, to bring this not to the attention of the international community, but to make it something that people have to do. What do you think? Go ahead. Aram, would you like me to answer that or would you like to take more Yeah, questions? go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no, uh, Steve, it's a really, really smart question. Let me just say, by the way, that I don't know if you follow the group Akavot. It's an Israeli group that's been, has gotten more and more access to the archives and they've been um, publishing fascinating articles. Um, you can f follow them on Twitter. Uh, they, they publish in Hebrew, but sometimes in English. I, I find them fascinating in terms of the archives. Um, I will disagree with you on one thing, though. I'm not sure that Israelis are in denial as much as they kind of are in a bubble, as you said, towards the end of your comments, right? I mean, I think there is some level of recognition um, that Palestinians have faced hardship. Uh, over time, you know, maybe it's not to the extent of what we describe, but, you know, they will quickly point, either point the finger at other things, say, well, you know, terrorism, violence, you know, or, or, or say, you know, they had opportunities to accept what's there, or they'll say it's small compared to the experiences that the Jewish people have faced historically, 
or they kind of shrug their shoulders and just say it's unfortunate, but hey, this is reality. But the bubble is the bigger phenomenon, uh, you know. I think, especially in places like Tel Aviv, where you can entirely forget uh, that an hour away there are two million Palestinians caged in the Gaza Strip. It's actually mind-boggling. Having you know been based there for for for, for this job for several years, you know, I, I you know you can feel the disconnect. Um, and it's not, by the way, just in Tel Aviv. You can go into settlements which are in the heart of the West Bank and the way the roads and walls have been built, you forget that there are Palestinian communities um, that are around you. So how do you burst the bubble, I think is the better question. Um, for, from my perspective uh, at Human Rights Watch, part of it is to have the right analysis. And so long as the analysis is about, you know, a situation of two equal sides an occupation that's temporary, democratic Israel, you know, that, you know, is, shrugs the shoulder, it doesn't sort of force the issue, right? But I think when you um, accurately describe this as a situation of, of apartheid for millions of Palestinians, it suddenly becomes different because Israel is different. I would say the Israeli government is different than the Assad regime, for example, in the sense that it cares about how it's viewed in the world, right? It wants to be seen as a democratic progressive state that's you know, shares values, maybe not everybody, I should say, there are parts of the political spectrum that could care less, you know, about that. Um, but I think that's part of what makes the apartheid charge have, you know, some level of effect uh, is that there is, um, it, you know, there is a narrative there. That's also why I had effect in South Africa. So I think shifting the paradigm is critically important. I think raising the costs of the status quo in a, obviously in a peaceful, you know, way, um, you know, I think, you um, you know, uh, providing a language and a framework that can move the conversation and bringing the sorts of accountability and tools that crimes against humanity warrant. I think to me, that's that would be, but you're asking a human rights person. So you might get a different answer from academics or, you know, uh, uh, comparative, comparative, you know, uh, political scientists, etc. No, great, great, job. Job. great job. Thank you. We need to move on. So Riyadh, please go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you, Sharam. Uh, Omar, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. appreciate that. You mentioned the International Criminal Court uh, decision that was, was a historic decision, of course, after 50, more than 50 years of occupation. Finally, there is a legal jurisdiction uh, to, to, um, to address the issue of human rights abuses in Palestine. Um, what in your opinion, is there any legal uh, ground for Australia's position in, in, in criticizing the decision of the ICC? Does the Australian government have any uh, legal grounds to stand on in their criticism of the decision, you think? First, let me say you might win the award for the best background I've ever seen in a, in a year and a half. On um, I told you let so. Me say, <laughs> let me just say to your question that um, there is an argument that Australia has. It's not one that Human Rights Watch shares. Their position, um, and I, you know, I don't want to overly simplify it, but is basically that how can the international? So let me take a step back because uh, I know there are non-lawyers in the audience. The, the International Criminal Court only has jurisdiction over country, uh, over areas that are signatories to the Rome Statute, states that are signatories to the Rome Statute. So the Palestinian Authority signed onto the Rome Statute um, on behalf of the state of Palestine. There are some states, Australia included, that believe, well, Palestine is not a state. So how can it possibly uh, sign on with statu you know, a statute like that and be a signatory? Um, what the International Criminal Court spent some time discussing this very, very issue, and the court issued a ruling saying the court does have jurisdiction, that it's not the court's place to say what isn't isn't a state, but the UN has recognized it, you know, as a state party, and, you know, they have joined the International Criminal Court, and so that suffices for us to say that there's jurisdiction. Now, that's a position contested by other states, including Germany uh, and the US. What makes Australia's position worse I would say then, I'm, I'm putting aside the US and, and Israel for a minute, is that they've directly called on the court to not exercise jurisdiction. Some states like Germany have disagreed on the jurisdiction, but once the court ruled said we support the independence of the court. 
Australia's statement went a step further in saying, you know, don't exercise jurisdiction. That, in our estimation, we wrote about this as Human Rights Watch, infringes on the independence of the ICC. The International Criminal Court, to live up to its mandate, must uh, be independent to pursue its mandate, including um, all allegations of serious abuses uh, wherever the evidence leads. And I think Australia's position to challenge the jurisdiction of the court uh, uh, or to say the court shouldn't exercise its jurisdiction uh, goes a step beyond what other states have done and is in, in contradiction with um, rule of law and international law more generally. Thank you. We go to Ahmad Tiskin now. Thanks, Shahram. That was a great presentation, Omar. Uh, my question is more about um, just getting a feel or your, your view on civil society organizations within Israel, uh, human rights organizations. How are they tracking? Are they gaining momentum in trying to uh, sway public discourse or does it sort of get drowned out whenever there's uh, incidents happening and the political machinations sort of take over and everyone sort of goes back to that uh, support Israel at all costs kind of um, attitude? Just want to get your thoughts on what's happening at the ground force civil society. I think it's hard to deny that there's been a sea change in the conversation in recent weeks and months. Um, you know, there are many data points, but let me say to your point, like when the hostilities began, right, um, in Gaza, um, normally people would just revert back to thinking of the start of everything as the rockets. But so much of the news reporting, so much of the conversation talked about root causes. In fact, that was in the UN resolution that was passed for the Commission of Inquiry using language from our report. That's a shift uh, from previous times. The shift can be tracked, you know, I think in other ways, right? Um, there are many examples of it, right? I would say the amount of people who've used the word apartheid and persecution in recent weeks since our report has been released. Uh, I mentioned the Israeli ambassadors. I mentioned states, and it's not just South Africa and Namibia. Luxembourg used the term. France's foreign minister in an interview said that the status quo produces a reality of apartheid. You had prominent parliamentarians and Congress people across the globe European parliamentarians, I, I addressed the European Parliament, US Congress people, I briefed the US Congress also myself. You had Jewish American groups that are progressive that were taking strong positions. You had academics, you had pop culture icons, you had John Oliver, uh, you had, um, you know, uh, musicians, uh, you know, Dua Lipa, who has 8 million followers, you know, citing, you know, our report and our work. I could go on and on listing things, but I do think there's a shift. Uh, that's that's noticeable uh, in the conversation that has taken many different forms. Again, it's difficult to trace it to one thing, uh, certainly a single report. Um, but I think there, you know, th this is a, ultimately a reflection of the reality on the ground, which has become more and more clear. I mean, I think many people around annexation talked about if it happened, it would be apartheid, right? Um, but annexation didn't happen as a formal matter. But de facto, annexation continues on the ground. And because apartheid is a term about domination, not sovereignty, if you believe it's apartheid with annexation, as a legal matter, you should believe it's apartheid today. So I think more and more, it's dawning on more and more people that the reality on the ground isn't what uh, has been assumed for so many years. Um, and I see the conversation absolutely shifting. Now, does that, you know, will that translate into impact? There are some that have argued that the US, I mean, the Biden position was atrocious, you know, on the, on, you know, on what happened in Gaza. It's at odds with much of the Democratic Party. But even the Biden administration faced pressure and ultimately, you know, uh, pushed for a ceasefire maybe earlier um, than we'd seen in previous wars in previous years. Now, again, there are many factors that could produce that reality. Um, but I think what, what it remains to be seen whether the international community will, you know, take the action that's required. But certainly there's been a shift and it's going to be incumbent on, you uh, all of us who care about human rights in Israel Palestine to see to it that the shift leads to real change on the ground over time. Thank you, Omar. Now we go to Leanne Spencer. If you could uh, introduce yourself, Leanne. Hi, um, I'm Leanne. Uh, first off, I want to thank you, Omar. Uh, that was a really informative and passionate presentation, uh, which I really admire. Um, so this, this is more of a reflection, um, perhaps a bit of a question at the end, but I wanted to say, um, you know, I, I agree that uh, the situation has been quite grave for many years now in Palestine. 
but as I'm a quite young um, Aussie girl in a rural town, um, quite often in the past when I have uh, brought up the situation with um, friends, peers, family, um, most people really had no idea what I was talking about. Um, and if they did, they only knew that uh, very stereotypical line that it was, you know, this terrorist Israel had to do something to protect their country. Um, but I have noticed that a massive shift um, in the past couple of months with the recent hostilities. I've had people come to me, um, have you heard what's happening uh, with Israel, with Palestine? Um, they know I'm interested in human rights. Um, so I, I'm a sociologist. My mind automatically goes to, oh, um, you know, perhaps growing globalization, the rise of social media, um, as you've just covered just now, um, you've got lots of celebrities, uh, models, um, TV, talk, uh, TV hosts talking about it. Um, so there's a lot more access to the information, um, growing awareness. Arguably, um, there's been a shift in those norms around you know, caring um, and knowing about international human rights. Um, so I think I just wanted to reflect on that shift and something coming as you know, coming from a relatively young um, girl, as I said, in an isolated town. I was going to translate that to a question about um, what you thought about recent discourse, but you have just uh, touched on that. But I suppose um, it could be questioned whether past uh, just that um, international community in terms of you know, politicians reacting, et cetera, perhaps whether um, just ordinary citizens um, becoming more aware, first in that bubble, um, talking about it on social media and the like. I see things on TikTok and Instagram. Um, you know, upcoming generations, whether that might, um, you know, actually contribute to meaningful change. Thanks for your reflection. That's really, I mean, it's, it's, it's really interesting to hear and for your question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think ultimately it will uh, lead to change, right? But, or it could, let me say, it, it could lead to change if it continues to develop. Um, the reality here is so many countries' policies on Israel-Palestine are, are at odds you know, with, I think, where popular sentiment is. Um, now, in authoritarian countries, like in the Middle East, you know, the UAE or, um, you know, Jordan or Egypt, you know, the disconnect um, is tenable because they're authoritarian governments that can, you know, sort of clamp down on it. In democratic countries, um, I think it's different. Um, and, uh, you know, I think in the United States, for example, um, you know, uh, the fact that more democratic, for example, Congress people are speaking out is because their democratic average party members are speaking out because there's more interconnectivity between different struggles. And they, you know, there's actually a political cost now for, for being out of touch with, I think, where the base of the party is doing. So I think uh, there are other places in the world too, where I think if popular opinion shifts, um, the calculus for, for, for political, again, people take positions for different reasons, not some of them have an ideological attachment, some of them it's for political reasons, you know, or, you know, they want to do more, but they don't want to face the political cost of doing more. And so if those uh, factors change, um, I think it's easy for policy to change, right? Um, you know, for a lot of people, um, you know, they know the reality. It doesn't take much to tell anybody who's been there, especially spent time in the West Bank or East Jerusalem or Gaza, you know, what the situation is. But sometimes they don't see the benefit of speaking out, so they'll be silent. But I think when the popular conversation shifts, and even in, a, in, in authoritarian countries, even in Arab states, you know, it's difficult, you know, for them to, you know, for some of them to go too far beyond public opinion. And so, um, so yeah, just, just a reflection in response to yours. Thank you so much, Omar. Um, I might, um, if there are no more questions, I might pose a, a final question. And that is to do with uh, this narrative of self-defense that Israel uses uh, to justify its policies, whether it's in relation to uh, Gaza, whether it's uh, the various checkpoints that they uh, have in the West Bank. And that narrative of self-defense seems to um, seems to dominate Israeli politics and it also seems to be seen as uh, justifiable in the international community. I wonder if there are um, challenges to that narrative in um, 
Israel, especially given now that we have a change of government, whether the new government that includes some Arab uh, politicians would um, perhaps modify that narrative? Yeah, I mean, I would say that, um, you know, the self-defense narrative is prevalent, although I think it's gone down. I mean, the salience has gone down the past two decades where Israel's faced far fewer, I mean, you know, almost, I mean, basically no suicide bombings in the last decade or, or more and, and fewer sort of events in which Israeli, uh, Israelis are killed as, you know, in relation to the conflict. Um, I, I um, you know, I, I made clear in this report that for, you know, we use the term apartheid or persecution not to refer to like every action that's taken by the Israeli government, but a particularly set of policies that fall under the law. And for many of those, security really isn't an explanation for why the Israel, why the Israeli government confiscates Palestinian land or denies building permits to Palestinians and not, you know, Israelis. There isn't really a security justification. And in other cases, I think people know that security is a pretextual argument. Now, when it comes to Gaza and particularly like the recent hostilities, security, I think is a more prevalent uh, consideration in the minds of, of more people. Um, but I think there's also a recognition, particularly among um, the army. I mean, the army in, in Israel has actually been more moderate as compared to the political forces because they kind of get the couple of uh, former head of Kogat, the body of the Israeli army that oversees the territories, you know, at one point called for a Marshall Plan for Gaza because he understood that the long term Israeli security is is not actually served well by um, the closure policy and rounds of armed conflict. In terms of the new government, um, I wouldn't expect change when it comes to Palestinians. That's significant. Um, they, uh, leading officials have already made clear that they will be maintaining, uh, you know, the status quo when it comes to Palestinians. Um, and, uh, you know, if anything, Naftali Bennett's opening address to the Knesset this week, he talked about ensuring Israeli interests, uh, you know, in Area C. And if we want to look more carefully at the government, yes, there are um, center left parties in the coalition. But, you know, the base of power of this government is the right wing. And in fact, Naftali Bennett is widely considered to the right of Netanyahu and the key post, interior minister, foreign minister, uh, well, foreign ministers, Yair Lapid, but interior minister, justice minister, defense minister, these are all either holdovers or center-right forces. So unfortunately, I don't see this government taking steps to improve the situation. And there is a risk that I see for it getting worse. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks so much, Omar. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, so thanks so much for this really uh, important and uh, groundbreaking report that uh, you have produced. And uh, we congratulate you on this achievement. And thank you very much for joining us. Everyone's virtually clapping for you, Omar. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you so much for being with us. And thanks to everyone else for uh, joining this forum, wherever you are, whether you're in uh, Middle East, uh, Europe, or Australia. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day or your evening. Thank you. Thank you.